wasn't taken very seriously. It was this funny little box that occasionally produced some pictures and some sound. The high art of presentation really reached a peak with television. People argue endlessly about who's the cart and who's the horse in the world of television. Does television follow our trends or does it mold our trends? With a passing wave and a faint flickering, images of the future appeared on a snowy field. Television. From its simple beginnings in the years following World War I, television grew to be the dominant mass medium for information and entertainment in the 20th century. Its programming reflected and taught us our values. Its images mesmerized the nation and the world. This medium of light and images became the window through which we view ourselves. As America celebrated the end of the war to end all wars and roared into the 1920s, two inventors, one a Russian immigrant, the other an all-American boy, worked to develop the medium that would change the world. Well, Adamir Zaworkin, Russian immigrant, studied with Boris Rosing at St. Petersburg before the Russian Revolution, uh, immigrated to the United States. The quintessential corporate guy. He worked within the framework of a huge corporation, RCA eventually, had a lab at his disposal where he would supervise numerous technicians developing television, had the tremendous deep pockets of RCA behind him in his development. Philo Farnsworth, grew up in the wilds of Utah and lived in the western United States most of his life. Child prodigy. When he was about 16, he went up to his high school teacher and said, look what I'm going to do for a science project. And he proceeded to diagram an invention he called television on the chalkboard. The story of Zwarikin and Farnsworth is uh, crucial to the medium's development. The p key piece of technology in the invention of all electronic television was the creation of the scanning beam the machine that actually reads an image and then transmits it to a cathode ray tube in order so that you and I can look at that screen and see an object in motion. That device called the image dissector by young Farnsworth and the iconoscope by the senior inventor Zwarikin became critical to the development of television and interestingly enough Zwarikin could not get his machine to work without the patents which had already been promulgated by Farnsworth. It was uh, probably one of the more pivotal moments in, in broadcasting history when Zaworkin and Farnsworth finally faced off. RCA was using an invention that Farnsworth claimed as his. A lawsuit eventually evolved from it. Anybody who was following the proceedings would probably feel that Farnsworth was incapable working alone to come up with an invention to rival what was put together by RCA and their team of uh, technicians and scientists in their laboratories. But uh, the courts felt otherwise. And the story goes that when RCA paid a license fee for the first time in its history for the inventions of others, the uh, NBC attorneys had tears in their eyes. Even though television showed promise, it still faced obstacles. The technology was primitive and the Great Depression decimated its market. While America struggled through the 1930s, RCA worked behind the scenes on its commercial potential. By 1939, Transmissions traveled from the Empire State Building to Schenectady, New York, 160 miles away. The same year, David Sarnoff and RCA debuted the wonders of this new medium to the American public. It is fitting that the greatest World's Fair in history should be the scene for the first public showing of one of the most significant technical and social advances of modern times. At the World's Fair, 
Uh, Sarnoff became the first television host when he introduced the first television president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who actually appeared at the RCA Pavilion on television to announce the opening of the World's Fair. And the TV exhibit was one of the most popular exhibits at the New York World's Fair of 1939. In the very beginning, I don't think people realized what sort of a novelty it was. It wasn't taken very seriously. It was this funny little box that occasionally produced some pictures and some sound. And so the people who owned them were sort of considered oh, pioneers and experimenters. It wasn't considered a very serious business to be in. Uh, but people with vision who got those licenses, of course, developed them very nicely, it turned out to be a very lucrative business, turned out to be very good, and by the time everybody else wanted to get into television, all the licenses were chewed up. So the people who got those first licenses were rather smart, rather wise, and very wealthy to boot. For a long time, it was a two-network environment. CBS and NBC were really the two giants in the information business and indeed in the entertainment business as well as far as television was concerned and that was an outgrowth of radio. Two key players shaped their success. David Sarnoff of NBC and William Paley of CBS. Their contributions opened the door to a world of programming and commercial opportunities. But world events put the growth of television on standby one last time. Well, events in Europe, in particular World War II, deflected any experimentation into television and the mass production of television throughout the war effort. Indeed, the very same technology that was poised to produce television for the American consumer immediately became the stuff of sonar and radar and uh, radio electronics that were at the heart of America successfully winning the Second World War. Everything froze down because of World War II. And it was frozen. Uh, nobody built receivers. Nobody could build stations. There were no stations authorized. Uh, about 1946, uh, they began to put in applications for new TV stations. Uh, receiver manufacturers started building TV sets in fairly large quantities. Uh, turns out that after about 1947, I guess it was, they were producing seven million a year. There were some who said it had great promise. There were others who said that it was a noisy, sputtering gadget, a passing fancy. The rest, you know. The end of the war signaled new hope for the nation and the television industry. In 1945, there were eight stations on the air. By 1950, there were 98. More stations meant more programming for more viewers. Television was here at last. By 1948, television had appeared in the Sears and Roebuck catalog as something that you could order. And by 1948, both CBS and NBC began a regular schedule of broadcasting in the evenings, first on a limited basis, and soon expanded to seven nights a week. Television went from a very few homes, mostly the homes of RCA or CBS executives, to a mass activity, to something that everyone in America wanted. It became the national craze. The FCC was swamped with the applications, and they didn't have enough channels to, uh, to give out, so they then declared a freeze in 1948 that lasted until 1952. And consequently, what happened was the stations that were already on the air by 1948 through 1952 became the dominant stations then and many still are because they had the exclusive right to the frequency in the boom years until the FCC finally uh, got to the backlog of TV applications. From 48 to 52, television becomes and takes the shape that it would have to this day in the form of major networks, their owned stations, and their primary affiliates. While three networks came to dominate television, a fourth network, based in Philadelphia and headed by Alan Dumont, was instrumental in the development of this new mass medium. What Alan Dumont did was twofold. 
For one, he introduced a means by which televisions could be mass produced and marketed in an affordable way for the home consumer. But even more important, Dumont, like William S. Paley before him at CBS in the late 1920s, began to attract a roster of performers to his new network. Uh, are you the um, night watchman? Yes, sir. Who are you? The King, um, uh, police department. <laughs> Your partner's inside. Uh, he's expecting you. He's in there with uh, a body. The networks followed suit and soon found that the medium's past, present, and future were rooted in radio. People would sit and listen to the radio. In some cases, they would even sit and watch the radio. Uh, then along came television. At the beginning of television in the late 1940s, almost everybody who was anybody in radio went into television. Hello, darling. Oh, there you go, nagging, nagging, nagging. <laughs> comic sketch in the variety program were the mainstays of uh, early radio programs and they were translated into television with uh, such services as Ed Sullivan and uh, later Steve Allen and all of the big variety programs. The networks didn't really know what part uh, comedy would have until they bumped into Milton Berle and he became uh, super successful and a lot of people didn't have television uh, sets uh, at that time uh, to watch him and so in apartments, they would collect in one person's house that did happen to have a television screen on Tuesday night. And in one room, there, there might be 50 or 60 people trying to watch this uh, Milton Berle hour. And down the street at a television store, uh, you might get 100 people looking in outside the window uh, trying to see the same program until eventually um, people began to buy television sets because they saw that television was uh, worthwhile. Uh, to own a set, and the prices began to come down. Well, this week spring arrived, and everybody started working in their gardens. I'm not much of a gardener, but I do enjoy trimming down the hedges. So would you, if you live next door to Jane Mansfield. <laughs> Cabinet doors came off, and parlor chairs that once faced each other now faced the two. Television uh, has probably had some influence uh, socially on the family unit. At first, uh, bringing the family together, th there were only the three networks. Local stations didn't do much programming of their own. So there were just three programs to watch, basically. So it wasn't difficult for a family to agree on what to watch. And they only had one set in the beginning. So the family was gathered around this instrument. In the early days, many people watched television just because it was new and different. Uh, they would sit and look at the flickering lights uh, because it was something new and different and exciting. Television became America's storyteller with a variety of genres that broadcast the values of the times. Looking at the industry by genre uh, is a kind of a convenient way of categorizing things. Uh, in the old days when you would talk about a western, you pretty much knew what you were going to see. It was a morality play of white hats versus black hats. Historically, the western formula was an incredibly rich area to explore American themes. It dealt with the conflict between civilization and savagery between frontier and modernism, between evil and the townspeople and the cowboy who sort of stood between the townspeople and, and the bad guys. New genres brought new audiences. In a quest to capture viewers, programming reflected the country's cultural and economic climates. For the first time, families took center stage. In the 1950s, when Lucy and Desi were having their baby, little Ricky, most of America was having the baby boom. And so there was a tremendous empathy, a bond, between the characters on television and the characters and the people watching at home. Hello there. My, oh my. What a gimpy bunch of gear you got. <laughs> Rocky Jones in the XV3 calling Mr. Secretary. Come in, please. For all these little kids around America now, who were growing up with television. So why not 
shoot a television show, initially a special, from the point of view of an average American kid trying to get along with his brother and his teacher and his parents who didn't really understand him. Well, that little kid was Beaver Cleaver, and the show was Leave it to Beaver. And that, in a way, if you look back on it, was a landmark show, because unlike Lucy, in which it was the parents talking down to the kids, the Beaver phenomenon introduced a whole new aesthetic for the situation comedy in which the kids, the inmates, ran the asylum. New genres also attracted sponsors and gimmicks. High-stakes quiz shows tempted audiences with dreams of cash and fame. When the producers of 21 were caught giving contestants answers, scandal rocked the industry and the nation. Hearings were held at the highest levels of government. As television came of age, it also became more technologically sophisticated. In the early 50s, both NBC and CBS had competing color television systems. Indeed, by the mid-50s, by 1956, for example, NBC is broadcasting Peter Pan in living color. Of course, not too many people then had a color set, but if you were lucky enough to have an NBC set, you could watch Mary Martin in color. Few did. One more technological advancement would solidify television's place as trendsetter, as storyteller, as record keeper. In February 1956, Ampex debuted the first video recorder. We then announced that we would record a sequence and immediately play it back. We recorded it for about two minutes, rewound and stopped the tape, and pushed the playback button. Completely silent up to this point, the entire group rose to its feet and shook the building with hand clapping and shouting. Cheaper than film, videotape could be played back immediately. It could be rerun again and again. From the primitive transmitting and small screen receiving instruments of 1939, we have advanced to this complex array of tape machines, remote pickup units, and large screen colors. is a talk on national security because the nub of the whole purpose in an earlier system, era politicians had discovered the power of radio to communicate with the masses now in the 1960s politicians and the nation discovered that television communicates on many levels the Kennedy Nixon debates demonstrated that you have to be sort of slick a little bit cool a little bit laid back to really make the best use of the uh, of the medium in the political campaign since then, almost everybody now has three or four media advisors who advise them on what makeup to put on, what kind of tie to wear, what kind of jacket to wear, where to stand during an interview. So that kind of dimension was added to uh, the whole political process simply by the uh, presence of television at that uh, pivotal 1960 debate. For eight years, until the, the Nixon-Kennedy television appearances in, this, in the 1960 campaign, Richard Nixon was the, the world's leading authority on political television appearance, which is probably another reason why he sort of sailed into the appearances with John Kennedy from a probably an over, overly self-confident position. Kennedy was tanned. He was rested. I refer to the fact that in 1958, as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I'm very familiar with the position that the United States took in negotiating it came the at the end of a long uh, grueling day for for candidate nixon several times in the course of this, these debates and in the campaign that america is standing still america the interesting is not study about the uh, the debates that uh, always struck me is a study that was done with people who watched the debates and their reactions to them compared to people who listened to the debates on radio those people who listened to the radio debate were much more inclined to rate Nixon as the winner. Those people who watched the televised version of the debate were far more likely to nominate Kennedy as the winner. The medium that had brought the family into the living room next brought the nation together with a power and presence that no other medium had approached. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. For four days, 
Americans watched the aftermath of the assassination unfold, imprinting images on a nation of mourners. Jack Kennedy was the first real television president. Uh, he ran a televised campaign. He knew how to use television. Uh, his people understood it. And when he was assassinated, all of a sudden, the American public discovered that they could look to television to provide them with information that they really wanted. And it had the capacity of drawing the whole nation together as, as a family. What we didn't realize at the time was the impact that that was having worldwide. It was the first event that the world really shared in. It was embryonic by today's standards, but what became clear in the years after that was that the notion of tying the world together with an event like that through television had had its real impact with the Kennedy assassination. In the years that followed, television repeatedly captured history broadcasting America's conquests. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And her struggles. The key to the Vietnam War, really, was the fact that, and we will never, ever see this again, I'm convinced, and I almost never use the word never, but in this case, I will. We had access to that war on a level journalistically that nobody has ever had access to any human conflict before. There were no restrictions. There was no censorship. That was the first war that was literally brought into uh, everyone's living room. Uh, through through television and even though it was film it it provided the viewer with the ability to see people dying you didn't simply read about them you saw them die and that I think was critical in terms of how the United States viewed Vietnam it was in everybody's homes every day it was not unusual for the evening network news broadcasts which by the way in those days delivered as a primary source of news, information to 85% of American homes, half, two-thirds of those broadcasts were news about the war in Vietnam in one way or another. It so dominated the agenda for such a long period of time that it had an impact that I don't think any other story will ever have. As the country changed shape in the 60s and 70s, programming trends coincided with America's moods. Fantasy and escapism acted as a buffer to the volatile 60s. The high art of presentation really reached a peak with television. And when you could actually see the performers in your home, uh, it would be difficult to forget the impression that the Supremes made when they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show and to see stop in the name of love and it was a visual, people might know the song but you see it, everyone remembers this gesture uh, just as Elvis Presley and cutting him off the way so you couldn't see the hips swiveling there are certain images that remain. Through the 1970s television went from escapism to relevancy. In 1971 17 and a half hours of prime time were devoted to cops and robbers. Previously taboo subjects appeared on screen as a new genre gained popularity, the adult sitcom. You found in the early 70s this great blossoming of creative talent set up apart from the studio system with their own independent powerful links to the network. And what you got was radically new forms of programming. And it was a great time. It was a great time creatively. Everybody made money. It was really a good time in the business. The big show was MASH, which was tremendously long-running and very popular. An actual a situation comedy, but with real depth and, uh, and attitude. We had characters like Hawkeye Pierce coming into our home every week for 11 years. You got to know these people as if they were members of your family. You got to understand them, see them in all situations. You got to see them grow and change and feel pain and happiness. And we learned from those things. We got to know these people very well. In the 1980s, television presented a mix of intimacy and opulence. 
In the 90s, it continued to be a major source of entertainment and information to America and the world. TV has been called one of the most um, significant media of all time, and I wonder if that's true. Um, it's certainly uh, one of the most pervasive in places around the world where they barely have electricity. They seem to have television. So it's wended its way around the world. Um, it would have been nice if, like print, uh, the presence of which promoted literacy, that television promoted some ability to, to uh, create things visually more, and maybe it will as time goes on. Uh, but people argue endlessly about who's the cart and who's the horse in the world of television. Does television follow our trends or does it mold our trends? And there are people who do research on those kinds of things. So I think uh, that unlike the atom bomb that really has only one purpose and it's unambiguous, uh, television is going to remain ambiguous for a long time with believers on both sides and hopefully experimenters on both sides. I think of a, uh, a game called Canasta which was around and very popular for a while. Um, and sometimes people built the analogy to television. They said, oh, it's canasta. It's here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> it just isn't serious. In the early days, there was an awful lot of feeling that, that television was really a novelty that would find a niche. It would find some small role to play in, in life overall. That obviously changed over time. And I have never known any prediction in television that didn't come short of reality after that. Television, a mainstay of American communication and culture, journeyed from a simple scanning device to a mass medium in a relatively short time. For better and worse, it has affected families and society. It has added color to America's complexion and exposed the country's blemishes brought the moon and so many stars into the nation's living room. From a fuzzy image to a powerful focus, television has forever changed who we are and how we view ourselves. <laughs>